The history of philosophy is not like the history of sciences to be studied with intellect alone. That which is receptive in us and that which impinges upon us from history is the reality of man's being unfolding itself in thought. Every year from September 15 to October 15, people in the United States of America celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month to recognize the contributions and influence of Hispanic Americans to the history, culture, and achievements of America. The mission of our channel is to illuminate the philosophical ideas that have gone unnoticed by both the academia and the general public. So in aligning ourselves with the mission of our goal to spread knowledge and untapped wisdom that has been developed over millennia, we would like to take this moment to commemorate the role that the Hispanic philosophers have played in shaping the Latin communities and their immense influence on the world history. Before we examine the philosophy of the Hispanics, we must confront the same argument that people often employed for non-Western philosophy, and that is, Hispanic philosophy is not real philosophy. In this lecture, as a gateway to understanding the nature of Hispanic thoughts, and dispel the misconceptions that people have, we must first begin by finding the answer to several questions that the naysayers have, such as whether there is characteristically Latin American philosophy, and what makes it different from other mainstream Western philosophy. The question on whether there is characteristically Latin American thought is a century-old question that has been asked since 1925, starting by Jose Carlos Maria Tagüe La Quira. Although the question may seem like a question with easy answers, it is however disputed among Hispanic philosophers. This question can be understood in two ways. One being a factual claim that there is a characteristically Latin American philosophy, and the other being a model claim that there could be a characteristically Latin American philosophy, with Maria Tagüe denying the existence of Hispanic philosophy. If the factual claim is true, then the model one is also true. But if the model claim is rejected, then that may be in conflict with the factual claim. Maria Tagüe instead rejects the factual claim by proclaiming, All the thinkers of our America has been educated in European schools. The spirit of the race is not felt in their work. The continent's intellectual production lacks its own characteristics. It does not have an original profile. Hispanic thought is generally only a rhapsody composed from the motives and elements of European thought. To prove this, one can merely review the work of the highest representation of the Indo-Iberian intellect. Some, like Augusto Salazar Bondi, have also argued that a distinctly Latin American philosophy does not exist, because it does not have any significant major philosophical figures, such as Plato, Buddha, and Confucius, who all started their own schools and have a tremendous impact on world's history. Furthermore, Hispanic philosophers are still being influenced by foreign schools and traditions, unlike back during the colonial times, when Spain still had absolute power. As Salazar Bondi notes, Philosophy in the subcontinent was originally a thought imposed by the European conqueror in accord with the interests of the Spanish crown and church. It has since been a thought of the upper class or of a refined oligarchical elite when it has not corresponded openly to waves of foreign economic and political influence. In all these cases, underdevelopment and domination are influential. 20th century Brazilian philosopher Alfranio Coutinho also shares a similar sentiment regarding Brazilian philosophy. With the exception of the positivist, he maintains, Brazil has had no original philosophers at all, since they still have colonial mentality, which is not the ideal mentality for building a creative philosophy, Coutinho wrote. I cannot imagine how we could have any other mentality without having complete independence, economic and cultural, from imperialistic powers. Although it is certainly true that Latin American philosophy has been influenced tremendously by European culture, they have ignored the possibility of the existence of Latin American philosophy in the future, so their rejections still have not refuted the model claim. Furthermore, neither the claim that Hispanic and Latin American philosophers have not had any impact on the world history, nor the claim that they have not had any original ideas fall short when we consider the cases of Iberian philosophers. Despite the fact that they were born in Spain and Portugal, they still focus on philosophical problems generated by issues specific to Latin American and its local realities. Furthermore, they did develop original schools of philosophies, one of whom is Francisco de Vitoria, who started his own school that made original contributions to natural law theory and has had a great influence on international law and human rights. The same goes for Bolivarism, Aerialism, 
or Sorwana's feminism. As to whether or not it is possible to have Latin American philosophy, we must examine the nature of philosophy itself. If we approach the nature of philosophy from the universalist standpoint, then no matter where philosophy is practiced, what is to count as philosophy is the same, meaning that the model claim would be false. Just like science, after a scientific theory has been formulated for an event that has happened universally, any contextual factors are irrelevant. Therefore, universalists may argue that philosophy with Latin American characteristics cannot exist if the context behind the interest does not matter. However, it can be argued that the universality of philosophy is compatible with the existence of characteristically Latin American philosophy. Culture, society, and the circumstances that one is in always have some relationship with philosophers and influence the framing of their philosophical theories. Therefore, even though Latin American philosophers may be concerned with problems and issues that are universal to everyone and proceed by rational methods, there will be branches of a general theory that are analyzed more narrowly to tackle specific issues that are unique to Latin American philosophy. Leopoldo Zia insists that the abstract issues of philosophy will have to be seen from the Latin American man's own circumstance. Each man will see in such issues what is closest to his own circumstance. He will look at these issues from the standpoint of his own interest, and those interests will be determined by his way of life, his abilities and inabilities, in a word, by his own circumstance. In the case of Latin America, his contribution to the philosophy of such issues will be permeated by the Latin American circumstance. Hence, when we Latin Americans address abstract issues, we shall formulate them as issues of our own. Even though being, God, etc. are issues appropriate for every man, the solution to them will be given from a Latin American standpoint. If the Universalists do not object to studying medical ethics, then it is not possible for them to object to the existence of Latin American philosophy for medical ethics is just a branch of ethics. Just like how Latin American philosophy is simply yet another branch within cultural philosophies. Others may also argue that the problem with the existence of Latin American philosophy lies with the fact that philosophers do not study philosophy because they cannot separate their philosophical interest with non-philosophical interests. Riceri Frontitze asserts, It is undeniable that the works of Sarmiento, Bello, or Marti to maintain three great examples contain philosophical ideas, but such ideas appear as a result of literary or political concerns to which they remain subordinated. In none of them does philosophy have an independent status. None of them set forth philosophical problems motivated by philosophical interests. We are of course not reproaching them for this. Their work fills us with satisfaction and admiration, nor are we trying to understand the historical causes, the cultural and political circumstances that hinder the growth of philosophy in the strict sense. We only wish to point out what seems an undeniable fact, that philosophy has been subordinated to non-philosophical interest. For people who agree with fantasy, they define philosophy for the pursuit of philosophical questions for their own sake, like professional philosophers at the universities. As obvious it is, this criterion that Frontitzi puts forth to claim that there is no Latin American philosophy contradicts the previous criterion that others have put forward. The bigger issue is that if this criterion is applied consistently to all the philosophers, then we must also apply this to European philosophers' works, which also contain philosophical ideas that are subordinated to their authors' social, political, and literary interests. If this argument holds true universally, then we must also reject the work of Plato, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, John Paul Sartre, John Ross, and many more. However, this conclusion is clearly false, since all of these philosophers are considered legitimate philosophers. Therefore, the Latin American philosophers that we will be studying can be considered as legitimate philosophers whose ideas are philosophically engaging and astute in their insights for these ideas. Philosophy in Latin America will develop a lot more and can only progress only if we start considering these thinkers' clear and provocative ideas and engage ourselves in reflecting upon the issues that address the unique challenges that the Hispanic and Latin American faces in their diverse experience that may be different from typical Western norms. In the next lecture, we will analyze Hispanic philosophy by starting with studying the works of Iberian Spanish philosophers. We will finish today's lecture with a keen insight that Aristotle had for those who cannot accept anything that other cultures have produced and is blind to the realities of the world while adamantly claiming that they are the rational ones. The many, however, do not do these actions. They take refuge in arguments. 
thinking that they are doing philosophy and that this is the way to become excellent people. They are like a sick person who listens attentively to the doctor and acts on none of his instructions. Such a course of treatment will not improve the state of the sick person's body, nor will the many improve the state of their souls by this attitude to philosophy.